Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all participants on the third day of the this year IDM. Before we start, I just would like to remind all that uh, after the panelists of each panel, you have possibility to use the Q&I function to raise the question or ask for the floor, as well as a raise of the hand function. Before we start with the pan first panel today, we will watch one small video one more time to underline the importance of the migrant story, something that always IDM has, but this time due to the virtual event that we are organizing, we'll actually show the movie. Under the campaign done by IAM IDM, what is do together, IAM.ENT, where you can see a little bit more on those stories. This story is called Mila's story. That basically, we learn a little bit more on the Martian Iceland's problem on somebody who is on the front line and somebody who's actually feel what climate change can do to the migrant. Please go ahead with video. My name is Mila Noah. I'm 13 years old and I live on Ligib Atoll in the Marshall Islands. My dream is to become a professional wrestler. I love my home so much because it is so beautiful. Everything in this place is good. I did not know what climate change meant. Then one day, some people came to our island on a yacht. They told me the seas are rising and one day, Ligia might disappear under the water. That scared me and made me sad. At my family's house, we have a seawall to help protect us if the water rises. But I don't know if it will be strong enough. There is a marker in the sea at one end of Ligia. When the tide is out, you can see where the edge of the land used to be. Now, it is underwater most of the time because the sea has eaten the shore away. Sometimes the sea water washes into the wells and makes the water salty, so we can't drink it. At our school, we have a machine that takes the salt out of the water, but we still have to be very careful how much water we use. Our teachers say the weather is hotter than when they were young. That is why we have so much drought now and it is much more difficult to grow fruit and vegetables. Me and the other children in Ligia love to play together, climbing trees and swimming in the lagoon. And we love the animals that live here. Some of my friends help raise turtles. They keep the babies safe from being washed away by the sea or killed by other animals till they are big enough to go back in the lagoon. Next year, I will have to leave Ligia to finish high school on the Big Island. Even though I love it here, I may have to stay away for a while if I want to do more studies and learn wrestling. But this is my home and I want to be able to come back one day. If it disappears under the sea, I don't know where I will go. When I think about climate change, I know we all have to be strong and stand together. So the land is not destroyed and animals and people can always have somewhere to come home to. Wow. 
Uh, now I would like to go forward to today moderator who is Mrs. Uh, Dina Unesco, who is uh, uh, basically someone who is behind most of the work that we did uh, in this year, uh, IDM, uh, head of the Migration, Environment and Climate Change Unit uh, within the IOM. Dina, floor is yours. Yes, hello. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you for kind words and thank you for amazing collaboration to put this uh, event together today. I'm very happy that we started with this video uh, because our panel today will speak of different stakeholders approaches and I think that kids are at the center of uh, who the main stakeholders of all this discussion are today. And also the video we just saw, it's very important for us because it's part of um, the work we do with our fund, with IDF fund, that it's a key uh, support to our work on capacity development and not only communication and, and beautiful image that say migrants' voices, but beyond it, really supporting our work. So I will do a short introduction for the panel and I will explain how the panel goes on and who our uh, wonderful speakers are today. I want to greet absolutely everyone who is already online with us. Um, as a first remark, I just wanted to take you two minutes back uh, in the past. Uh, 70 years ago, IOM uh, was born. It's a daughter of the Second World War war and grew its first years in the Cold War. It's in 1990, so it took us 40 years to start looking into environment and climate change. And the trigger was the 1990 IPCC, so the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change first report that was really already sending uh, signals that uh, migration and climate change can be connected and we should care about that. And it's since then that IOM kicked off its action on this topic. 20 years ago, we are in 2001, the organization launched this international dialogue on migration. It's the oldest dialogue at multilateral level that exists. And 2001, the world was shocked by the fall of the Twin Towers. So here we are, uh, again 20 years after. 10 years ago, 2011, we organized an international dialogue on migration, environment and climate change and 10 years more have passed. We are in 2021. We are also shocked uh, by uh, this pandemic that has taken the world over and had such an impact on migration. And we are here on Zoom, all of us, because of that. But in spite of Zoom, uh, being all Zoomed, <laughs> we want energy for this uh, panel. We want two key things. Um, and before I give the, pan uh, the floor to the panelists, we want to highlight two key messages just for today as we start the last day of our dialogue and we start this session. First thing that we want to say is that we look very often at climate change and migration, at the tragic and displacement and sad dimension of it. But we want also to make sure that we look at the positive outcomes of migration, at the adaptative dimension of migration, and at the contribution of migrants, of diasporas, to climate action and to sustainable development. This is one of the key objectives of our panel today, to showcase solutions, to showcase voices and examples of what can be done. And the second key message, we are the heart of what an international multilateral dialogue is about. It's about different voices, bringing extremely different perspectives, and that's what our panel will do today. So for the panel today, I will introduce our speakers uh, as we go ahead, uh, but we have the chance to have a, a keynote speaker today, and the chance, the immense chance to have the Minister of Environment and Physical Planning of North Macedonia, Mr. Uh, Nasser Nuredini, we are extremely pleased to have you on uh, because I think I understand you also have a migrant experience quite strong in your own life, uh, but also because we saw that your excellencies, you have key goals to drive really clean and green investments in the home region and also to, to, to use your migration and cross-border experience to, to bridge the 
differences between West and East and bring everyone together. And I also understood that you have a very strong passion from green economics. And this is at the heart of our discussion today. How do we connect this discussion on migration and displacement to green growth and what solution we can see? So we look forward to having your uh, presentation today about the strong political engagement and, connect and the commitments from North Macedonia as much at the regional, global and national levels. So um, we look uh, forward to this, I pass on to, uh, the, pa the, the uh, floor to you and give us energy. Thank you, Ms. Ionescu, uh, dear participants, dear friends, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, thank you for actually giving us the opportunity as the Republic of North Macedonia to participate in this very interesting, so to speak, uh, topic. And as the video so clearly stated, we're all in it together. It's not an individual uh, issue we're facing here. Uh, to start off with, I think after watching that video, one can only emotionally can be emotional about it and realize that we, we don't only need to do our part for our country and our region, we need to do our part for the whole world in this instance. Uh, as we all know, and you mentioned, we've been Zooming ourselves lately because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has uh, been a very unfortunate event, and we've all been caught off guard in this event. However, though, thankfully, we have uh, the smartest people in the world working together for the first time to find a solution. And they have. We have got vaccinations, we've got the rolling out, which will support, hopefully, us to overcome this. Climate change is something that has always impacted the livelihood of, of uh, the citizens. Uh, we've known about this over the last few decades, I would say. So, the COVID-19 might have caught us off guard, but climate change is not catching us off guard. However, though, if we do not act now, we should have acted already. But if we do not act now, we're going to further have uh, issues of love, uh, actually endangering the livelihoods of our citizens. We are a small country in the southern uh, southeast of Europe, in the Western Balkans. We are a country which is developing and is going to be working towards the EU accession. However, though, we're also very well aware that we are a country which is going to be impacted heavily by climate change. We already have, and as Mr. Unesco mentioned, I am a child who's been growing up abroad, coming back, etc. These were our challenges in the past were more economic challenges, hence why we have a lot of migration, immigration from our country to other countries. As a country in itself, though, we are in the path, of course, of international migration. So let's uh, to just state one thing. A, a few years ago, we had over one million migrants passing through our country towards the, towards the developed countries of the EU. Now, in order to actually try and participate and do and contribute to the global issue, we as a country, of course, we revised our NDC to the Paris Agreement. We have taken a very bold decision to lower greenhouse gases by 51% compared to the 1990 levels by 2030 which is a net reduction of 82%. Now, this sounds bold and this sounds costly. However, though, one of the things that we all need to be aware of is the investments in green energy and renewable energy, and sustainable development, are actually a change of our own behavior. It means the changing of our consumer, the way we consume the products, what we consume. So these are actually costs. This will be actually a benefit and a profit, as we like to say, the investments we're making today will be a profit to our citizens, not only our citizens locally, but if everyone does their part, it will be a benefit to the, everybody in the whole in the world. As we know, what we do actually, of course, is in order to create, so to speak, the uh, post-COVID-19 economic recovery, which will create a sustainable development and an inclusion as well of the socially vulnerable, vulnerable groups, not only in our country, but also the mig migrants who move to our country and hopefully maybe potentially entice our own citizens to move back to us, is we're looking to create the green economic recovery. However, the green economic recovery sounds a bit mythic. However, if we look into the details, what we're saying is we want to invest in renewable energy. We want to invest in energy efficiency. So we have set up these funds. These are labor-intensive jobs. These are uh, local products. This is going to support the local economy to kick to restart. But that's not only about the economy, at the same time, we are gonna be using less energy. A country like ours, which is unfortunately very heavily dependent on coal uh, 
producing electricity through a coal-fired power plant, we need to move away from that. Hence, while we are committed to decarbonization, we are actually going to uh, go green. We're going to invest in solar, wind, and hydro. What does this mean is the fact that this will be creating new jobs, new jobs for our own citizens here, as well as migrants that might move to us. This, unfortunately, if we want to stop this, because we will have more migration in the world the whole time if the climate is changing. Living conditions, especially for the, especially for islands, which are very susceptible to climate change, are going to become more and more difficult. I think it is our obligation, every single one of us globally, to participate, minimize the effects, support the migrants who are actually losing their livelihoods due to climate change, due to the economic developments of the developed countries. Thereby, I've also said this in other, in other conferences to the international colleagues of ours, it is not just us, the small countries, that need to make these uh, very ambitious uh, dedication to climate change. It is also an obligation to the large developed countries to support the smaller developing countries and also large developing countries in order to, for them to actually become more sustainable. We all know that the developing countries have been developing over the last decades and decades. They've achieved a certain life standard and we should support the other developing countries now to achieve that, that same life standard through sustainable development. And because I also understand that there was also arguments from developing countries, if they have polluted in the past to achieve that standard, then we should be allowed as well. Hence why I think it's an obligation of all of us to support these areas, these countries, to develop in a sustainable way so that we can all make a change and minimize the effects of climate change. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you so much, Excellency, uh, for this uh, uh, very uh, realistic and encouraging speech. Uh, I would say that to have uh, a minister speaking in the same um, uh, speech about emotions and ambitions and the nationally determined contributions, it's a wonderful mix of how much we need both vision and heart and really concrete very concrete commitments for this topic. Uh, thank you also for highlighting uh, the points um, on um, uh, that countries now uh, are, the majority of countries are home destination and transit countries and the challenges for small and, and medium and big, big uh, countries all together uh, joining in the same uh, objectives, in fact. So thank you so much for bringing this uh, vision into our panel today. Um, as a next step, I will just very briefly mention uh, the names of our uh, speakers on the panel. We have five speakers and then uh, each time I will introduce more specifically each panelist. So we have Dr. Amadou Dia, uh, from uh, Senegal, who is a technical advisor at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and of Senegalese Abroad. We have Dr. Baljis Osman Elasha from the African Development Bank, uh, where she's a chief climate change and green growth specialist. We have Ms. Enja Zetren, who is uh, a senior business uh, specialist at Skatec in Norway. We do have also Mr. Irfan Ula Afridi, who is uh, representing our youth uh, and also advocacy voice with the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. And we have uh, Mr. Belal Altineso, who uh, represents the voice of, uh, let's say, also civil society, migrants, and also as an entrepreneur and the private sector, uh, co-founder of the So Ranch. So, um, maintenant, je vais juste uh, passer uh, en, à la parole à notre uh, prochain intervenant qui, je and crois, now I will give the floor to Dr. our Dr. next uh, speaker uh, who will speak in uh, French, as far as I know, Dr. Amadou Dia. He is a, a technical advisor. So, in this panel, we really tried to have 
and to hear different voices. So as a technical advisor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Senegalese abroad, you are in charge of migration, climate change, soil degradation and environment. So that perfectly fits with our topic today. It's very important to also have your vision. So, just also to understand how we can make the link with this contribution of a diaspora and migrants in this fight against climate change. You have a very broad experience in sociology, demography. You've also worked in international organizations and you also support refugees and asylum seekers. So I'll give you the floor, Mr. Dia. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for uh, willing to integrate the uh, government of Senegal and also to thank your and come back to the initiatives of the government of Senegal, but also to operate so that Senegal can be, of course, involved in the different international programs. It's very important for us. So Senegal has to be involved in different approaches to have a better integration of migrants and to have them more involved related in the nexus environment, migration and climate change. So a lot of uh, projects are around here here for West, Western Africa, we have the PDD platform, which is a disaster management platform. It is a platform to include all the migrations in the local planning, including civil society, to show how important it is to see if this can be done and organized. So this should be organized as fast as possible to promote all our activities. So it's really crucial to consider the uh, situation on the ground in Senegal, especially with regard to the climate work that is being done at the moment. Uh, we have one of our uh, key cities and, and that are actually that is really at risk of uh, a, a, a severe climate change issue to do with rising sea levels and we need to therefore look at the adaptation of our coastal areas for climate change. We therefore are really looking at uh, what we can do when it comes to our own uh, coordination efforts. When I was studying at university I looked at the channel, the English channel and uh, some of the coastal work that was being done on both sides, the English side and the French side. And I felt that uh, I wanted to actually bring that expertise to bear within my own country because we have some areas now that are really being swallowed up by the sea within the Senegalese coast. We're therefore looking at programs that could be put in place now to really try to shore up our defences and to try to ensure that we can really work together with the various um, 
local authorities and regions to ensure that uh, we can try to prepare for the future. Imagine now what the situation is when we are looking towards the future. We can perhaps try to uh, really launch this multi-stakeholder uh, process so that we can prepare to give those who are going to have to move the best possible assistance. This is linked to uh, climate change and also what's happening in the Sahel region. We need to support our, um, our uh, other governments uh, within the African region that are really facing some serious issues now. Um, along our frontier regions, we're now trying to work in collaboration, for example, with Guinea-Bissau and uh, with other important uh, partners to try to really develop our own uh, integrated approach to ensure that we can bring civil society organizations in to work with us and work with migrant associations also on a, on a national level. We really wish to to uh, place the emphasis on uh, collaborative work now, working with all our various partners to see how different sectors can be integrated within our climate change work, and particularly with regards to um, the destruction of our land and the salinization issue. So we have a migration development and governance project now uh, at national level establishing these links and these synergies. It's very important for us to uh, consider our various partners, particularly the EU, the Spanish government, uh, when it comes to actually identifying the needs of uh, migrants that we're actually um, dealing with in, in our country, and also uh, those who are now finding their livelihoods threatened, specifically to do with the fact that their land is getting um, increased less fertile. The Senegalese government have now succeeded in bringing in civil society organizations within our uh, departments working for uh, migration and also for climate change. We are working on our links with the private sector as well now, particularly uh, in the international level, but also within Senegal itself to try to really underline the importance of this nexus. I don't want to go over t my speaking time today, but I I'd like to just say that I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have. And once again, thank you again for this opportunity today. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Diaw. C'est nous qui vous remercions uh, pour avoir réussi dans un. It's us that have to thank you, Mr. Dow, for this very interesting uh, presentation and some very important messages, recognizing the voices of some of the most vulnerable countries when it comes to climate change is key. I think it's particularly important to. Uh, emphasize the issue of salinization and coastal defenses that have an impact on human mobility. Um, we have to really draw attention to good practices, I feel, with uh, the various organizations, migrant organizations and others involved. And this issue of the private sector is very important. This is perfect for our panel today because we're actually going to uh, speak with representatives from the private sector. Um, or to our next speaker. So I'm also uh, extremely uh, proud that we have Dr. Balgis Osman Elasha with us. Um, I think uh, that I, I want to just to highlight from uh, from Dr. Osman Elasha's uh, background that uh, she is a lead author. She was a lead author of the IPCC report, and in particular, one of the key uh, most recent IPCC reports on climate change and land, and that you were also in 2007, back in 2007, uh, named as a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize as a contributor to the IPCC. So this is an amazing, I think, experience and that you represented, I think, IPCC in Oslo, uh, which makes a nice transition and also with our next uh, speaker who is from Norway. I know that you are a forester by, by training and that today uh, you, you represent 
present um, in, in this dialogue as Chief of Climate Change and Green Growth Specialist and Regional Coordinator for North Africa Development and Business Delivery Center, the African Development Bank. So please uh, go ahead and many thanks again. Many thanks for you for the introduction and uh, thanks to the IOM for the invitation uh, to this very important dialogue. Um, and the chance also to shed some light on what the bank is doing in relation to uh, development and, and uh, green growth. I will uh, try to give, uh, um, to shed light, as I mentioned, on these activities that have direct and indirect impact on, on migration in Africa and sustainable development in general. As you know, the African Development Bank, similar to other MDBs, uh, it has its objective of uh, achieving sustainable development and poverty reduction. And uh, as such, it addresses some of the main causes of, of migration also uh, out of Africa. And if we look at uh, development uh, simply as uh, delivering uh, services, uh, uh, well-being, contributing to well-being and improving the life quality, uh, we can appreciate the role of the bank and, and, and its efforts to address these uh, uh, issues and also try to uh, reduce the inequality in Africa because these uh, uh, activities are uh, trying to be across the uh, different uh, uh, African countries and uh, across the different societies. So this, uh, the issue of inequality, as we know, is uh, one of the of the most important factors that uh, uh, contributes to poverty in Africa. And Africa is also known as one of the world's most uh, unequal regions. Income inequality is very evident in, in, in unequal access to resources and opportunities between rural and urban, between men and women. And, and uh, the bank is, is, is uh, considering this issue uh, seriously. That is why the long-term strategy of the bank 2013-2022 uh, focuses on, on two main objectives, inclusive uh, growth and the transition to green growth. Um, so it's uh, one of the areas that I think it, it warrants a real uh, uh, attention. Um, in terms of, of uh, uh, migration within Africa, it has always been a, an issue, internal migration and, and external also out, out migration. And uh, the problem with, with, with migration in Africa, especially the internal one, it's usually uh, out of the uh, production uh, size to urban uh, centers. And without... Uh, uh, real skills without uh, uh, opportunities for, 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 for uh, getting uh, involved in, in manufacturing or industries. And instead, the migrants are always being uh, absorbed by the service sectors and the informal activities, which are uh, by no means uh, contributing to production. So this will aggravate the, 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 the uh, economic problems and, 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 and poverty. Uh, problems in the countries and in the continents in general. So to overcome this problem, Africa has to become more industrialized and to, to improve its production capabilities as well as productivity across the natural, human, physical, and other capitals. And in contribution to address this gap and to achieve profound transformation of Africa's economy and to unlock the potential of its uh, citizens, the bank identifies five key priority areas, what we call high five, the high five, that is uh, feeding Africa through improved agriculture and agro-industries, uh, powering and lighting Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, that is promotion of regional integration, and improve the quality of, of the life of Africans, especially poor uh, women and, and young people. And, and uh, to achieve lasting change for Africa, we need to focus on the youth, of course. As you know, Africa is uh, continue to be like uh, the, the continent with, 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 the, with the most uh, number of youth globally. Uh, the youth in Africa represent a large, uh, more than 60%, and also 
globally the 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 number will be up to maybe one third by 2050 uh, of the global youth in Africa. The problem with that African youth are also escaping, escaping poverty through migration and uh, poverty because of, of, of many factors. Some of them are related to climate change, others related to uh, unemployment uh, opportunities. So, um, out of, of 13 million youth that enter the labor market in Africa each year, only 3 million get stopped. That, is, that means 6% are not employed and that it not, they are not contributing to economic activities. And, and they, they, they were left with no option but to, to, to migrate. That is why migration trend in, uh, to Europe is still like uh, embarrassing for Europe and for Africa. Uh, and the bank identifies that the lack of employment opportunities uh, for African youth is one of the most critical policy challenges of our time. And so the bank developed the Jobs for Youth in Africa strategy. The strategy, the strategy selected three flagship programs as a priority areas. Uh, it's uh, agriculture, industrialization, and ICT. And uh, based on this, it launched a, an initiative Jobs for Youth in Africa. This uh, initiative target the, to keep, equip more than 50 million youth with employable skills and create 25 million jobs in agriculture, ICTs, and other related industries. Uh, the bank will, uh, will work through this initiative to help mobilize 3 billion, 3 billion US dollars to support the young inter entrepreneurs in Africa, uh, focusing on business incubation. And it will facilitate the establishment of a skills enhancement zone. This is the, the an enhancement zone that will foster better linkages between skills and industrial development. Uh, some examples of these programs are the in agriculture, for example, is empowering novel agribusiness-led employment, abbreviated as enable youth. It aims to help uh, African men and women to incubate and scale up their agribusiness. As of now, the program is implemented. Uh, in, in, in 11 countries um, across Africa, and there are room for more. It's uh, a total investment of around almost 900 million US dollars. Also, the program is uh, uh, supporting the IFT Center of Excellence in Kigali. This is a joint initiative between Kigali Institute of Science and Technology and, uh, and Canadian University. So the bank provided like 40 million US dollars to support this and to have like a second generation of, of uh, uh, generation of computer experts in Africa. The bank also supported the establishment of digital technology parks in Senegal and Cape Verde. Uh, coming to the uh, issue of climate change and green growth. And we know that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier for Africa. Uh, it is uh, Africa considered as one of the or the most uh, vulnerable continents. So uh, the, the, the banks put as the main objective to uh, ensure climate resilience and, 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 and low carbon development in, in Africa. And uh, to, to, to facilitate the implementation of this uh, objective, the, the bank developed tools and methods and, and, and strategies that will safeguard its investments and also uh, climate proof the project portfolio. Uh, in this regard, the, the bank implemented concrete actions through the promotion of land use management, uh, smart agriculture, water resource management, resilient infrastructure, and urban systems. Also, also the bank financed uh, the the, 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 pro, the proportion of climate finance in the bank portfolio uh, kept increasing uh, from 9% in the, of the total portfolio in 2016 to 36% uh, by 2019. And now the aim is to have 40% of the portfolio labeled as climate finance by, by the end of this year, 2021. In addition, the bank committed to provide 25 billion in climate finance by uh, 2025. 
the bank is helping the regional member countries access climate finance to implement their nationally determined contributions and, and climate change, other climate change strategies. Uh, so the bank gets accredited to uh, the regional implementing entity for most of the global funds, including the Green Climate Fund, the, the Climate Investment Fund, the uh, GIF. Uh, moreover, the bank established critical internal finance support mechanism uh, to address issues related to uh, climate information, that is the uh, Clean Deaf Special Fund, uh, to uh, adaptation in Africa, uh, Africa Climate Change Fund, ACCF, Africa Water Facility, um, Africa Crime, Climate Smart Agriculture Program, the Desert to Power uh, Program, and, uh, and others. So these are uh, internally, uh, internal funds within the bank. Also, the bank is, uh, continues to develop new climate funds targeting different sectors like forestry, agriculture, the private sector, and uh, our partners uh, are very supportive in this regard. Uh, like now we have the Canada FDB Climate Finance uh, Facility and the Africa Circular Economy Multi-Donors Trust Fund supported by Finland and Nordic Development Fund. Uh, so, um, and the bank in, in house now is uh, developing an initiative that is a uh, uh, NDC hub, which is established to support the regional member countries implement their NDCs it is like a platform where partner institutions coordinate their climate change support interventions to deliver actions and uh, in, a, in a very coordinated and, and efficient way. Uh, for uh, women, there is a dedicated fund for African women that is Affirmative Finance Action for uh, Women in Africa, abbreviated as FAWA. This is an initiative to mobilize 5 billion in new financing to support women business in Africa. As of today, uh, the bank is working with, for the yeah. yeah, this is the last sentence. <laughs> working with 24 financial institutions in 15 countries, and uh, within this of our program, and it's expected to expand by uh, rapidly by 2022. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't know there was an intervention, but it was at the end of the of the time, so that was uh, helpful. Thank you so much for bringing this um, very complete uh, intervention to this panel. I would just highlight uh, as a key point, I think, how you started on the question of inequality, and which is key question on the multi-causality of migration and how difficult it is also for us to just isolate the environmental and climate dimension from everything else that's development, conflict, education, uh, demography, the wide range of questions uh, we are facing when we discuss this topic. And also thank you for highlighting the gender dimensions and thank you so much for giving all this uh, uh, wide range of different initiatives that are uh, such a variety of, uh, of, of initiatives and of bringing also to our attention the key question of the climate funds and of the access to climate funds and the difficulty we have still to have projects with a migration dimension being funded by the climate funds. So that's absolutely key as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I will pass now to our next speaker. We have three more speakers on this panel. So now it's really uh, my pleasure to uh, have Miss um, uh, Enya uh, Sethren, I hope it's well pronounced in Norwegian, it's very difficult, uh, <laughs> who represents for us today the vision of the private sector uh, from our uh, partner, Skatec. You have also an amazing, amazing um, background, and I must say, as a senior business development analyst in Skatec now, you work really towards increasing the access to renewable energy in developing countries. And we have also including collaboration with IOM on the solarization of the Malakal humanitarian uh, hub. But you uh, are in this um, uh, uh, private sector focusing on operating renewable power plants globally worldwide, but 
with a true focus on developing countries. And you have yourself also a, a whole background on refugee uh, question, humanitarian. You work with the uh, uh, foreign affairs. You work with the World Food Program. You have amazing experience. So I stop introducing you and I let you speak. You have also seven minutes. Thank you so much Anya, for being with us. Thanks so much, Dina, for that kind uh, introduction. And first of all, it's very inspiring to hear uh, about the green ambitions of both North Macedonia, Senegal, and the AFDB. Let me just start by, by putting Scatic on the map for you. So, so Scatic is a global renewable energy business that develops, builds, operates, and owns renewable energy projects across technologies in developing countries, as you rightly put, Dina. And what we do is becoming increasingly important. Around 800 million people do not have access to electricity globally, of which 615 million people live in Africa. And for displaced people, the numbers are especially striking. And limited access to energy is also a huge impediment also for other development indicators, such as protection, education, and jobs. And with displaced populations already being vulnerable on all of these indicators, lack of access to energy serves to reinforce pre-existing vulnerabilities and hinder development and reintegration. Energy needs in non-OCD countries are expected to increase by more than 80% by 2050. So if we are to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, it will thus be immensely important what choices we make today in order to reach tomorrow's energy needs. And renewable energy needs to be at the cornerstone of that transition. But despite sort of the, the crucial role of, of energy in, in, in the humanitarian action and commitments to carbon neutrality, the green transition in the humanitarian sector has been a slow coming process. I mean, the humanitarian agencies spend more than a billion USD on polluting fuel every year. And with a protracted crisis across the globe, fueling humanitarian aid can often consume a quite substantial part of the humanitarian budget. And apart from the obvious negative climate and cost effects, the diesel generators have not even been able to provide a secure and stable access to energy, you know, often hampered by power supply risks or, uh, or um, fuel disruption. So in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and reaching both net zero, increased electrification globally, and the SDGs, we have to embark on a massive scale up of renewable energy. And the humanitarian sector must be part of that transition. And we are ready. I mean, the technology is mature and cost saving. And we have also designed a model that specifically targets the needs and the procurement needs of humanitarian actors and tries to address the bottlenecks that until today has hindered private sector collaboration for providing green energy to displaced populations. And our solution is release. And I'll tell you why replacing fuel with solar and battery will both reduce emissions save cost and ensure a reliable power supply. So release is a, a pre-assembled, containerized, movable and modular solar and energy storage system for rent, which then connects to uh, the existing diesel generators to replace diesel and the electricity mix. And the key added value here is flexibility and simplicity. So being conscious of the budget structures in, for instance, the UN system, Contract durations are flexible down to one year with then the option of either prolonging the contract or buying the assets at the end of the contract. And should the humanitarian activities in the area come to an end, well, then the contract can also be terminated. So short term contracts, limited upfront payments uh, serves to reduce the buyer's financial commitment, both on the guarantee side and on the balance sheet. And it's immediately cost saving, you know, both compared to conventional solar in the same time perspective, but not least compared to diesel. So really making it easier for humanitarian agencies to embark on, on the green shift. And using batteries also addresses the, the power supply risks uh, experienced with diesel generators, um, making the system stable and, and operable and enabling delivery of solar power 24-7. Uh, the system can be scaled up or down at any time, depending on the need. Uh, it's quick to deploy. It can, the plan can be up and running like six months uh, after a contract is signed, and, and it can be redeployed. And that fact that this mobility factor also limits the environmental impact in, in preventing any permanent occupation of land, which is also a key factor. 
Um, so I often say that release makes Solar simple uh, because you have a simplified structure with one contract only. It, it's really like a plug and play solution where the equipment comes uh, pre-assembled in containers. Scottec uh, installs the equipment at the site and monitors uh, the performance 24-7. And then we also train the humanitarian staff in local offices for maintenance, which also support uh, knowledge transfer and, and, and capacity building. So we have several release projects in our portfolio, um, around 300 megawatts. And what is remarkable here is that uh, many private sector companies, uh, for example, mining companies, have shown a great appetite for the release concept, you know, driven by increased pressure to, to reduce their carbon footprint. But ironically, we haven't really seen the same sense of urgency in the humanitarian system. But last year, uh, as Zina mentioned, we, we commissioned our first release project with the humanitarian actor, uh, combined solar and uh, battery storage plant in uh, South Sudan uh, with IOM, which heads the humanitarian hub uh, in Molokal. And that plant has a, a PV capacity of 0.7 megawatt solar combined with 1.4 uh, megawatt hour battery energy storage system. Then is that connected to IOM's existing diesel generators. And what's amazing about uh, this project is that it reduces annual CO2 emissions by 80 to 90 percent uh, by covering 90 percent of the energy needs with solar power. And it's cheaper, giving reduced energy costs of around 20 percent. And it provides a more reliable and robust energy supply than diesel. So it's like a no brainer. Uh, and, and, and the good thing is also that the release model can also be a driver for local development, you know, with the potential to expand and deliver energy to, to health centers, to schools and to other community services, knowing that namely unstable and costly access to electricity is a huge impediment for effective service delivery in, uh, in rural areas, particularly. So the humanitarian agency would then act as the anchor client on the ground, and then with the possibility to connect to the local grid in the second phase. Uh, so that has a clear local development effect uh, in, in both strengthening government-led service delivery, and also with the handover of permanent energy infrastructure to the municipality after 10 to 15 years. So, so to wrap this up, um, the negative secondary effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have made displaced populations even more vulnerable, reinforcing the pertinence of the nexus between migration and climate change. But crisis also provides a momentum to make a change, to build back better and greener. And it's time to, for the humanitarian agencies to, to start monitor energy use, to set emission reduction targets and, and cooperate with renewable energy suppliers. And I think also donors setting clear requirements on uh, to reduce fuel costs and emissions and, and DFI is playing an important role in providing financing and guarantee structures. All of that can also help sort of spark that change. But I think the key message for me today is that we have a ready-made solution that really responds to the responsibility that we all bear now as renewable energy has become the most cost-effective alternative in giving populations in remote locations access to green energy. And we're very eager to, to discuss with you today uh, and also onwards how we together can contribute to spur that green shift uh, in displacement settings. Thank you. I think that was all. Thank you so much, dear Anya Sedrin, for your uh, presentation today. I think you brought to our attention the key question of access to energy of displaced population in camps or not in camp setting, and also the key question of our own impact of our own operation on the environment. And in particular, I think the very strong awareness that has happened over the past two years on the humanitarian side to better factor in uh, green solutions and clean energy in the humanitarian response. So this is absolutely key. And also thank you for highlighting the, uh, the importance of innovative partnerships with the private sector and the UN and uh, all the organization and that solutions are already there. And that's very important. Thank you so much. I will pass now to our next speaker. We have two more speakers uh, in my list. So I would like to introduce now Mr. I Irfan Ula Afridi, who has the amazing task to represent somehow the youth. <laughs> no. the, the, you are at the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. 
a regional focal point for South and Central Asia. And I know you are also a humanitarian and DRR practitioner researcher with the United Nations University with the Institute for Environment and Human Security. So the floor is to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dina, for the, for the introduction and for having me. So uh, before going to, to my presentation, I would like to uh, kind of share some recent figures. Uh, so um, if we see the past year 2020, so the disaster which are caused by climate change caused more internal displacement than war in 2020. Uh, so especially if we talk about the natural hazard, so um, intense storm and flood, flood and trigger three times more displacement than violent conflict did last year, uh, and which lead to uh, 55 million internally displaced people by the end of last year, according to the figure published by IDMC. Uh, and according to the refugees organization, uh, 30 million new displacement last year were due to uh, flood, storm, and wildfire. So which is somehow clearly showing, highlighting the impact of climate change. So whenever a disaster occur, young people or children uh, are found to be present or a third of the victim of disasters. And youth are not just passive victim, but youth can react more flexibly and resiliently to dramatic changes as compared to adults. And despite that, young people can play an important role in protecting and improving the environment. So they can change their life uh, style, which can have positive impact in, in the environment. So they can also uh, make their homes, schools, and youth organization more environment friendly by adopting environment friendly practices like recycling of different material, as well as preserving resources such as water and electricity. So engaging youth in environmental protection not only create tiring impact on changing youth behavior and attitudes, but possibly influence their parents, relatives, and family. So we have already seen around the globe the youth are already in the forefront of fight against climate change and COVID-19. And the youth are resourced in climate change adaptation and sustainable development. But they can be a burden for the country, for the nation, if they are left unprepared and excluded from the different activities, especially if we talk about climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction or sustainable development activities. And research have shown that youth participation in climate change adaptation and sustainable development can help them learn topics that positively impact their lives while acquiring the practical experiences that support them to become a better uh, leader in the future. So if we talk about the youth um, expertise uh, and the youth uh, innovative ideas, so they have quite a lot of experience and they have already shown. So the youth can offer innovative solution to climate change, adaptation and sustainable development in their action in community can help reduce the impact of climate change and improve resilience. But unfortunately, however, in many countries, youth contribution and youth engagement and com uh, uh, community um, in climate change adaptation and sustainable development activities are below the desired standard. So if we talk about the nature-based livelihood uh, and the youth participation or in the migrant participation, so there's a range of nature-based livelihood that exists and can help address the crisis of nature and climate on one hand, while also creating us prosperity on the other hand. So those livelihood to maybe restoring forest, uh, building green infrastructure, protecting mangroves, uh, practicing agroecology and planting urban forest. Also the rain gardens, upstream and urban wetlands, spawn, green rooftop, green sidewalk and, and concept like spawns city which the youth can be an integral part of it. So the practical and implementable nature-based solution can protect and enhance nature while also will create, a, uh, as, uh, will create a sustain and enhance decent employment and contribute to the achievement of sustainable development goal. But the most important thing is while planning and decision-making process, the youth should be in the heart of all those mentioned activities. So if we talk about the youth challenges, so there's 
some challenges for youth participation and for youth leadership, which are institutional. And they in, uh, and it's include lack of proper platform where youth can come, can exchange their ideas and can somehow give the practical shape to the innovative idea which they really want to implement. And there is also capacity building, less of capacity building issues. And especially if you talk about awareness and education and climate change adaptation. So there's also uh, a lot uh, need to be work to build the capacity of youth. And the most important youth recognition is a key contributor. And other challenges also include tokenism and sufficient transparency in many countries and bureaucracy in many countries are preventing the youth to come uh, and to play the role which they want to play. So uh, institutionalizing many youth engagement Increasing coordination between the different organizations working with youth and also on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Most important investment on youth, especially on their education and capacity building and access to the finance could be the possible solution to enhance youth participation and sustainable, uh, youth participation and climate change adaptation and sustainable development. So to wrap up, today displacement crisis arise from many interconnected factors, including climate, and environment change, conflict, and political instability. So the world has been made more fragile by the COVID-19 pandemic and sustained political will and investment and locally on solution will be more important than ever. So if we talk about to build far better and greener, so youth should be put at the heart of the greener COVID recovery. And as rightly said in the video in the beginning, do the right thing. So let's come together. So let's work together. And working in the silos will not work anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much for your intervention. It shows the amazing richness of migration experience, in particular for youth and children in the positive and the negative, and the inclusion, the exclusion issues, and how much youth is the driver for change, the driver for for climate action, we see this at the COPs. I look forward to COP uh, for the youth uh, intervention. Most of the times, I think it's the, the, the strongest voice coming up. Uh, you mentioned also the challenges of bureaucracies and youth are the future leaders. So it's also about how you see the way they can advance and, and be included and, and contribute to, to, uh, to the sustainable development. So thank you so much for, for your intervention. This was great. And now I will pass to the last speaker. Je vais repasser uh, au uh, français. I'm now going to move into French because we're very lucky to now have uh, the other side of the coin represented, the private sector. We've had a Senegalese representative already, and now we've actually got an entrepreneur from Senegal, the voice of migrants as well, and uh, the diaspora. So we're very happy to now be hearing from Mr. Belal Altine Sao, who is a uh, the, our last voice on our panel today. Um, you have uh, spent a lot of time in the United States and now you have returned to Senegal and you are really pushing for the emergence of agroecology. You're passionate about agriculture and its importance, if I've understood correctly. And uh, you have founded your own uh, agroecological farm called Sow Ranch with uh, uh, an association uh, uh, with young Senegalese women. So it's an extremely exciting story, I think. And I'm going to now pass you the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to say good afternoon to everybody. I'm honored to be here today. My name is Bella Altinesa. I'm 53. I am Senegalese uh, um, and I've returned to my country, as you say, and I'm really passionate as a farmer about agriculture. What I would like to say is that the planet that we all share is now at a critical point. So we have seen a lot of waste, a lot of destruction and a lot of indifference. And the planet is now suffering because of this. There's a lot of uh, destruction and uh, change going on. And we are really feeling the effects now of climate change with an increase in uh, catastrophes, nat natural disasters, an increase in poverty as well. 
We see movements of people, particularly young people, from rural areas to the towns. This is happening a lot in our country at the moment. And they find themselves often unemployed and in very difficult, dif difficult uh, circumstances. So it's very important, I think, to look at uh, how we can tackle this and how we can really find solutions to the problem. We know that this is going to concern all of us. Of course, we know that certain countries are particularly affected, but the whole world is going to feel the knock-on effect. And we need long-lasting solutions now. We, we need to safeguard the planet for future generations, and it needs a global approach. The action, however, needs to be on a local level, first and foremost. And this is uh, now uh, linked to my own project. I, I went to the United States, uh, as, as we've said, and I have come back to Africa now, to Senegal. I've come back to my roots. I've come back to my homeland to actually try to bring in solutions on a local level for communities that have been really affected by poverty and clandestine immigration. I. I'm uh, just a small a farmer. I uh, studied in, in, in Morocco as well, and I have been able to try to uh, actually establish links and found my, I founded my own uh, sow ranch. So the idea is to really try to uh, place the emphasis on ecological agriculture. So taking into account preservation of the land, recycling and community solidarity for good practices and for autonomous land ownership and management. There are 14 individuals now involved with their own uh, cultivation areas and uh, we are really trying to involve our community in this transformative approach, really trying to draw upon interaction. The idea is to not use pesticides or fertilizers, not uh, uh, chemicals, and to really try to uh, work in an environmentally friendly way to place the emphasis on preservation. We wish to create decent work for people on a local level. We want to ensure that we can also train others so that they can learn these procedures. We have already trained or worked with around 500 young people since 2015. So these young people have been trained in different agricultural professions. Uh, around 150 uh, of these individuals are returnees, returning migrants. So we really do feel that we are training the people of the f who are going to really be great models in the future. So we, we, we call this the Agroecological Immersion Centre, our training centre. It's a, a great initiative, but I don't think it's enough yet. I think we really need to have an even more inclusive partnership. We need to really try to scale up our training as well and scale up our uh, linkages with other organisations to try to really tr to establish more of a rapport with uh, communities and with uh, other um, organisations. It's important to continue our uh, awareness raising work. I think this is crucial to really crown our successes and our efforts. Young people must be involved. They must be able to have possibilities and opportunities to develop their own initiatives. They must be given local development opportunities. And this must be with a view to trying to avoid people leaving as uh, clandestine immigrants. Local authorities, local communities must work in synergy with young people to really look at long lasting local impacts. It's very important, I think, to really place the emphasis on young people and to follow up on these trajectories over time as well. We have to really try, therefore, to uh, 
make sure that those who are going to continue to work the land into the future have the skills and have the, the possibility of making their livelihoods sustainable. We need sustainable solutions. We need to make sure that these solutions will be safeguarded for generations to come. These future generations really need to have respect for their lands. They really know, need to know how to treat it well. Soil is a key issue. We've seen so much soil erosion and salinification, and we have to therefore try to spread environmental knowledge on this issue and ensure that young people and young farmers can follow good examples in their practices. We've looked at soil contamination as a key issue and been working on trying to neutralize this, trying to tackle this. We feel that we can really be effective when it comes to breaking down barriers as well. If we work in this approach, if we try to really place the emphasis on awareness raising and that link between climate change and poverty and the loss of livelihoods. I feel this should be a way forward to create green employment. We need to try to really uh, reason and, and think better about how our agricultural industries are working, try to rethink our food systems so that we can filter this down to the most local level, but create synergies also between countries. This huge difference between the northern countries and the southern countries needs to be overcome. We need to create more partnerships on all the levels. All communities are humans. All communities share human concerns and all communities share our planet. We all need to be able to work in symbiosis, therefore, and we all need to work on sustainable development so that Africa can find its way forward for the future, so that this clandestine immigration ends. This is crucial, and this is what I wanted to say to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for making this very passionate link between uh, long-lasting, sustainable agriculture, entrepreneurship, and migratory risks. How can we reduce the risk of forced and clandestine immigration through these kinds of initiatives to give young people alternatives? Placing the emphasis on this local dimension, we're going to talk about this in the next panel, actually, so it's quite a good segue, I think. I now we came to the end of our uh, panelist uh, presentation. Uh, we spoke of the past, we spoke of the present, and we spoke of the future. We spoke of values, and we spoke really of solution, very concrete solutions. And I open now uh, the um, uh, discussion also to uh, the floor. Um, I saw a number of uh, questions uh, uh, for taking the floor. Uh, so I will start with uh, the ones I received uh, and, and go through them. Uh, so I have first uh, a request uh, from uh, our Deputy Permanent Representative of Ecuador, uh, Mr. Alejandro Davalos. The floor is yours. Muchas gracias, señora moderadora. Well, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. I would like to thank all panelists for their valuable presentations. Climate change effectively um, aggravates all the threats that uh, motivate people displacement, increases poverty, and also intensifies the pressure on our resources as well the possibility of conflicts and violence. Therefore, we need to take urgent measures to include migration and uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation in our debate. To this end, we need to strengthen migratory police policies, both at national and international level, as well as strengthening cooperation, especially regarding climate finance. Financing. We had to ensure that all strategies um, against um, climate change and climate change actions have people and people mobility in mind. 
Therefore, the Global Compact for a Safe, Order and Regular Migration is a key framework that would allow us to optimize the benefits of migration, as well as address the risk and challenges presented by climate change and natural disaster. The Compact gathers the need to prioritize uh, mitigation uh, and adaptation, as well as resilience, resilience against climate change in all those countries of origin, as well as minimizing any adverse factors that force people to migrate. The compact also acknowledges the fact that in situ adaptation is not always possible and there was we had to proceed to um, plan reallocations and foster regular migration. We had to um, work towards improving our agreement and understanding of the uh, link between climate change and migration and intensify and identify our actions and specific tools that we can use for their dissemination. We also had to strengthen cooperation as well as financial um, climatic financing in order to include people in our answers to climate change. Having expertise and technical assistance that are key to develop the capacities necessary to respond to uh, displacement and migratory flows related to climate change, as well as the creation of infrastructure, as well as the allocation of resources necessary to answer to this. Cooperation is key, so we can ensure that migrants are part of our green transition, and this way all states can build a more sustainable development and include human mobility in its process. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, señor Davalos. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Davalos. I have a next uh, request from the floor from uh, Ms. Eudis Almeida, Director of Foreign Consular Services from Venezuela. Uh, they are just connecting. I'm bringing them on. One moment. And it's Mr. Ewadis Almeida, sorry. Uh, we cannot hear. Hola, him. buenos días. Buenos días, buenas noches. Me well, good morning, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So in this very important forum for international dialogue on migration, environment and climate change, I would like to celebrate this initiative and extend the greetings of our constitutional president, uh, Mr. Maduro and Jorge Riazzo, our um, Ministry for Foreign Affairs. We want to uh, thank the IOM for uh, creating such spaces for debate. I would also like to thank all panelists for their contributions to this debate that allow us to consider topics of key importance for our world so we can better use opportunities to include migrants and displaced people in our policies. The Republic of Venezuela understands and acknowledges the need to include the Venezuelan people in our actions against climate change. We have taken already measures and steps in towards this end. However, we um, understand that this topic has not been included in the general debate in our societies. And it's only the realm of uh, ecological and environmental movements. So uh, acknowledging the existence of climate change and its direct impact on human activity is key towards a more effective decision making and creation of policies considering the social, financial and uh, human dimension. 
of the issue. Therefore, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela is always um, keeping ahead of the debate and willing to address climate change and its impact on its population, understanding that it is an element that has a permanent effect on our country. Education at all levels and it's all and all forms is uh, key to understand that climate change is an ongoing process that has ongoing and lasting impact on migration and can give way to significant transformations both in our country and in the world as well as altering the current economic systems. Venezuela, with its institutions, includes the youngest sectors in our country, so we can promote and foster a green revolution that has our planet, our Pachamama, in, at its core, that addresses climate change and its consequences, as well as the physical manifestation of its impact, together with initiatives for its mitigation and adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Almeida. I have a, a third request uh, from the floor. I'm very pleased to have uh, Mr. John Bingham from the NGO Committee on Migration. Hi, John. You are Hi, in New yeah. York, I think, now. So yes. please go ahead. Thanks very much. I, I'm representing the NGO Committee on Migration, where one of the top priorities um, of the uh, this global coalition of uh, national, regional, and international uh, civil society actors on the ground it is a responses uh, for migrants and migration and climate change context. So thank you very much to IOM and the speakers. Thank you, Dina, for, for really a fine panel and, and, and moderation. Just maybe three minutes maximum, maybe two and a half, um, concretely, as, as you said, Dina, so well at, at, at the beginning, give us energy, uh, you said to the minister from North Macedonia. And I think that's what migrants do. And you, when you added that it's important to talk not just of, um, of migrants forced to move, but migrants who move with their talent and their energy and their passion and their skills and their hard work and their innovation, um, that's the experience of, of migrants um, who cross international borders um, because of climate change and, and environmental degradation. So, you know, they have, an, they have an in the bones awareness of the problem and the in the bones commitment very often and energy to try and change things for the better. Um, so quickly, two um, concrete examples. Um, one in countries of, uh, of, of, of origin, uh, contributions to countries in orig of origin. And I'll follow happily the speaker from Senegal, from Sao Ranch uh, a few minutes ago. And one, uh, an analogy, uh, contributions that migrants bring to countries where they live. So um, the contributions that are made by earnings that migrants send home as remittances, remittances for survival, for resilience, for adaptation, for reconstruction, you know, about a week ago, the World Bank announced the latest figures of close to three quarters of a, of, of a trillion dollars, U.S. dollars, of earnings migrants send, send to their countries of origin, most of them to countries that are in, in developing uh, situations, um, many of them in countries that have suffered climate change and environmental degradation uh, in Central America, in Haiti. Um, in, in the Philippines and so on. So that contribution that migrants uh, in countries of destination send back to countries of origin. Um, and of course, as Mr. Sow said and others, the diaspora and migrants who return with skills um, to help their countries adapt or be resilient, among other things. And second concrete example, the, the contribution that migrants make in the countries where they live, the countries to which they've moved, an analogy right out of today's headlines and today's hopes, uh, the COVID vaccines, the two most uh, popular and effective COVID vaccines worldwide were created by companies in Germany and in the US that were founded by migrants. Uh, founded by migrants, Turkish migrants to Germany, Germany, German migrants to the U.S. 
French migrants running one of the companies in the U.S. Um, so migrants bring, as UNHCR likes to say, much more than just the bags on their back and what they can carry. They bring what's needed, and they do so in context of climate-forced displacement. So to finish, you know, this, this international dialogue on migration, always so smart and timely from IOM, it's actually talking about two types of climate change. One, the, the rough, the bad, the unwanted climate change, where the environment is, is ruined and people have to leave. But the other type of climate change is one we actually need. And that's a climate change that recognizes the importance of migrants to the whole world, as the minister from North Macedonia said, not just to one country, not just to one region, but to the whole world and what they bring that makes a contribution. And that's the kind of climate change we need to fight the other one. Now, channels for people to move, channels for people to work, channels for people to contribute their energy and their passion and their skill and a lived experience. Thanks. Thank you so much, John, for speaking of, uh, of remittances and more broadly about the, the contribution of migrants. I think this is a key uh, message from our side also for this uh, IDM. And I have one uh, more uh, request and then a question as well. So uh, I give now the floor to Uruguay to Miss Alejandra Costa. Thank you, Dina. Uh, yeah, we can, yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dina. Um, bueno, si quería simplemente, eh, I simply wanted to uh, make an intervention on in the, on the name of my country and express our uh, gratitude for being able to take part in such an important dialogue about migration, environment, and climate change. We know that climate change has complex and diverse effects and impacts. And faced to this, we had to analyze and categorize those future effects in order to make a, an effective and adequate decision making. In the case of Uruguay, the largest impact are the floods resulting from river overflow that has led to the evacuation of entire populations and the need to provide them with food, shelter, as well as health care, as facing the uh, financial and economic consequences of said displacements. Therefore, Uruguay, together with uh, many of the countries that are, are are joined in these efforts, have been working towards the mitigation of vulnerabilities and the building of resilience and um, climatic response, addressing the root causes of these displacements and creating the necessary elements to respond to crises when they occur. I know that it goes without saying that those at greater risk are usually those who are more vulnerable. Therefore, uh, Uruguay's uh, migratory uh, regulations are one of the instruments that we use to address these migratory movements. The cornerstone of the um, country's migratory regulations is the coordination of all countries so we can address migratory flows when they occur. After this, we proceed to granting all arrivals access to healthcare and education in our country. We have also made significant progress in recent years to mitigate risk and adapt to climate change by reducing vulnerability as well as the um, effects and consequences posed by internal displacement and external displacements. So in recent years, in our um, work related to migration, climate change, displacement, our environment, 
is um, always on the table. We cannot ignore what is going on uh, by gathering this information as well as empirical observations. We are able to understand the situation and from this understanding, try to anticipate possible consequences and work towards building greater resilience capacity, um, build capacities and make use of the technology available, working jointly in the development and implementation of policies that based on scientific evidence and always in line with human rights can help and address the situation of migrants. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to really uh, highlight and thank Ecuador, Venezuela and Uruguay for the last uh, interventions that really bring your region also into the discussion very strongly and highlight how vulnerable the region is and how many uh, original and innovative policy and practice uh, uh, options are put in, in place in, your, uh, in each of your countries. I have one extra demand now from a completely different region of the world from the Philippines, from uh, Mr. Albert Magalang. Uh, your, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, for giving me this opportunity to share the Philippine views on how to develop multi-stakeholder approaches, and uh, which would include other uh, uh, especially the private sector, and also to uh, how to um, in, um, in, ensure that there will be support for the in inclusion of migrants to build a sustainable future. Madam Chair, uh, thank you once again, especially to the IOM organizers and to the panelists of today's session. And... Uh, once again, for the, uh, thank you for the opportunity for giving the Philippines the, <clears throat> this time to share uh, our thinking on multi-stakeholder multi collaborations to ensure that migrants are provided opportunities to be productive and self-sufficient despite being severely affected by climate change, environmental catastrophes, and socioeconomic drivers like conflicts. So the coming together of various groups for purposes of producing a multi-sectoral outcome that addresses unintended impacts like migration, uh, this generates optimism that despite external threats like climate change and environmental upheavals, humanity can still surmount unimaginable difficulties and be inclusive as well, and at the same time, mainstreaming migrant groups who have been excluded and bringing them back into the fold. You ask us, however, how we can actually do this when migrants have just been uprooted and are in an, an unfamiliar territories which would appear threatening. Our response to that is, Migrants who have been dislocated from their homes and livelihood bases by environmental events like climate-induced disasters normally find comfort in being integrated and being streamed into familiar surroundings. If they came from communities which were dependent on the physical environment for well-being, they most likely will find comfort in being involved in nature-based interventions, which enable mm -hmm. them to gradually heal and become productive again. Okay, it only takes a, a little push you. and a modest amount of support to facilitate their reintegration into mainstream society. Whether in land or water undertakings, involving migrants in nature-based undertakings, we think is the fastest way to heal from trauma. Lastly, Madam Chair, uh, migrants have their own unique contribution to recovery and redevelopment in the aftermath of disasters. So they must not be treated as outcasts, but mainstreamed into society as soon as possible. In fact, they should constitute part of the recovery plan 
saying that they are almost everywhere and most of them form part of the regular working force in almost all countries. I'm blessed, Madam Chair. This mainstream consideration and treatment of migrants is as true for any natural hazard event as for human-induced ones that create displacement like the COVID-19 pandemic. Overall, the biggest resource for recovery are people, of which migrants normally comp comprise a considerable portion. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for speaking for the Philippines. We are coming to the end of the panel. I have one very specific question that I think will send also particularly to Mr. So from a participant from Martin Clifford. It's a very specific uh, soil and water conservation question. And I think uh, a question whether this can be also replicated in other contexts. Uh, we don't have now time if we want to move on to the next panel. What I will do now is just to give back to the panelists 30 seconds for a key message to close the panel, each of you. And I will start then with Mr. So, and then we'll pass you on the, the question more specifically so you can continue the discussion bilaterally because I think it would be a very uh, important and, and quite uh, detailed response. So back to you just for 30 seconds of a closing remark. Yes, thank you very much. This debate has been extremely interesting. Everybody's opinion has been so significant. We need to remember that together we face challenges and we must prepare towards in light of the COP. But we must do the work we need so that all stakeholders are engaged, particularly migrant communities, because they have their role to play. They have a voice to be heard, and it is up to us to create conditions that enable them to express themselves. I really liked my colleague's discourse. He talked about very important points, things we are not usually used to hearing. This framework helps us to hear voices we do not usually hear, and this allows us to change our perception, our vision of things, because we have much to learn from one another. This is in the collective interest of the migrants. Migrants have concerns. They know what they've gone through, and they have needs. If we can meet them, together we can find solutions to meet their needs that are so legitimate. We need different regional frameworks and different dialogue frameworks, which will help us to socialize together on these important issues, because we're really all going in the same direction. But if we do not work together, we cannot learn to work as a collective in a positive manner in the interest of the migrant communities. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity that has been given to us so we could together share these concerns. And hopefully we can all progress on such important issues. Yes, thank you. We will not hesitate to call upon you. You can be sure. Thank you once again, Mr. Dio. I will now give th the 30 second challenge. Challenge, uh, uh, Ms. Osman Elasha. One key message. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, yeah, on a positive uh, tone about migrants, I think they. Uh, I think they, they, they maintain uh, links with their uh, countries and they are, they, they really care and they like to share what they gained. So, and this is very evident. So they create this type of, of networks during a uh, crisis and they uh, mobilize resources. Uh, we have seen this uh, during uh, the recent Sudan revolution, we have seen it during uh, some of the um, uh, climate change related uh, floods uh, that um, uh, was very destructive in many parts in Sudan. Uh, we saw them um, 
mobilize resources and, and sending uh, back home. So, um, I mean, uh, this, this kind of networks that can um, be uh, formed um, seasonally or uh, on ad hoc basis could, could be uh, more um, utilized if a strategy uh, to uh, to make use of the of this uh, the migrant the capacity their their, their uh, finance uh, financial uh, support to um, to have like a kind of adaptation uh, projects something that is sustainable not only um, uh, on uh, on relief like uh, on crisis but something that will uh, link them more to their homes and also having a sustainable impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Message well received. Uh, Ms. Enya Sederen, 30 seconds key message. I'll speak very quickly. So first of all, I think the discussion today shows that there is a shared understanding for the need to scale up the shift in green displacement in, in displacement settings. And I think that we all have a role to play here. The private sector can bring in the technology and the competence. Humanitarian sector has the local knowledge and understanding of needs for, for operations and, and for the vulnerable populations they support. And what we share is, of course, a very strong commitment to the do no harm principle, which I think should imply that also humanitarian and actors take steps to reduce their carbon footprint in their host countries. And then just the last comment, if we really want to scale this up and scale up the green transition, I think that also DFIs like the Africa Bank and IFC can also play an important catalyst role. And especially when there is a local development factor here, uh, I think that should be very much aligned with the core mission, mission of theirs. But the key is that from a climate perspective, we start to run out of time. I mean, we're nowhere close to reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement, and we really need to accelerate the shift. And the point is that a value proposition is not really proven before you can actually show that it actually works. So I think it's important now to feel that urgency and find flexible ways of implementing more green projects to build that legacy. And that is what we've done with IOM in, in South Sudan, and we demonstrate that this works. Thank you, thank you Anya. That's a, I love the last words. It shows it works. Uh, thank you so much. 30 seconds, Mr. Irfan Ula Afridi. Uh, yeah, so my main um, message, uh, uh, you can say the main theme would be uh, to build forward better and greener. It's the time um, of transition from effective youth uh, participation to effective youth leadership. So listen to us not just work for us, but work with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. The voice of youth that goes far uh, into the future. And last but not least, Mr. Belal Altineso, we go back to you, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. We, uh... One last word. The last word is not for me. But we need to speak frequently. Having been a pessimist throughout our generation, we now need to update the way we think and work for the future generations. We must change our behaviors. We must be more humble. We must listen to the planet. We must review our ways of consumption. We must review our solidarity and our humanity. We must tell migrants that the world is yours. Behave well and inshallah, everything will work out for the better. As I've said, long live the planet. We together, we are the sons and daughters of the planet. We are all here on planet Earth together, the planet that we love. Yes, we do not want to be migrate to Mars. I do agree with you. So thank you so, so much for this lovely, to this lovely panel. Many thanks to all the people who took the floor. If there are extra questions, we'll pass them on to you very specifically. Thank you for all colleagues uh, and, and all audience. We will now close this fourth panel and we move to our last uh, panel, panel